Hello, welcome to today's mobile master chat. I'm Amy Lensing Tate with the UWM Alumni Association. We're so pleased to continue to bring you these weekly live streams featuring our distinguished faculty and talented alumni around the country. So today we have a treat for you. I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Margot Anderson. She's a distinguished professor emerita in history and urban studies. She specializes in American social, urban, and women's history and has research interests in the history of social sciences and the development of statistical data systems, particularly the census. Her many publications include the second edition of the American Census of Social History from Yale University Press in 2015. She's also the lead editor of Encyclopedia Milwaukee, which you'll hear more about next week. We will have time after the talk for questions, so please feel free to enter those in at any time. And thank you for everybody who entered them before the talk. And now I turn it over to Dr. Anderson. Um, I'm gonna talk today um, about uh, the census, and the, which is ongoing right now. By the way, Amy, I can't see my picture up in the corner. I don't know if other folks can, but um, um, that's not necessary. But if you want to put it there, go, please feel free. You're the technologist. Um, I'm going to talk about the census and give you a historical perspective about how, why, and where we count, and then focus a little more practically on where we are right now because we're taking a census during this pandemic. So um, I'm going to quickly run through the history and then I'm going to do some very contemporary stuff uh, um, about where we are now so that you are all at home, I hope, can uh, monitor the progress of the 2020 census as I do. So the whirlwind history is how, where, and why we do it and then how you can uh, per per participate by encouraging um, by answering yourself and then encouraging other people to do so. So the census goes back to the constitution in 1787 was, and it was designed to apportion seats in the House of Representatives in the Electoral College. And uh, I'll talk a little bit more about why the framers of the constitution did that in a minute, but let me add a second piece of, uh, of the story, which is that the US has had a really remarkable pattern of population growth and change. And we are a very diverse society and always have been um, going back into the 18th century. So I'm gonna take you back. Um, we've done it 24 times. So we, you, I'm showing you some logos. Here we go back from 2010, we're by 1950, 1940, 1930, and I'm going to skip all the way back to 1790. This is a picture in the Smithsonian Institution Museum in Washington, which has engraved on it the results of the 1790 census. So we've always paid attention, and I would um, to it, although the census, from my perspective, is what is called a rare, repeated, and very unobtrusive event in American political life. And I'm going to emphasize the politics of this a lot right now. Um, we've done it. Uh, 24 times in 220 years. Uh, by comparison, we've had a lot more presidents in presidential elections, and we are at the 116th Congress as opposed to only the 24th census. Uh, it's been repeated. We have done it successfully every 10 years, like clockwork since 1790, despite catastrophes, wars, the Civil War, economic crises, any kind of political turmoil. So it's very been very regular, and it's unobtrusive. Uh, in other words, most people don't remember the last one, the one before that, or the one before that. It comes around very quickly in uh, uh, every 10 years and then fades from view until we get the numbers. So uh, if I ask people um, sort of where they were uh, on April 1st, 2010, the last census, I get blank stares. If I ask them where they were September 11th, 2001, I, people remember. And it's the fact that we have to sort of remind ourselves why we do this and how we do this every decade that has kept my career going for many years. Um, the census is, in other words, Jaina's face. It looks backwards and forwards, and the methods change and develop. The results are always of great interest. And of course, we reapportion and redistrict political power in the United States every decade on the basis of it. Um, so constitutional history, very briefly. So you've got to conjure up a bunch of men sitting in a very closed hot room in the summer of 1787 in 
Philadelphia. And the problem they faced was that although the United States had won the Revolutionary War against Britain, the government was incredibly unstable and failing at the time. And so the men who um, got together that time, and it's, you know, the, the, the old white guys, right? Um, and another picture of the room, had to figure out how to deal with the fact that all, even in 1787, you know, you had a little bitty state like Rhode Island and a great big state like Virginia. And how do you balance their interests in a national government equitably? Well, the solution, of course, was the structure of the constitution that we've been known to ever since. And in particular, this is the census uh, paragraph, Article 1, Section 2, Paragraph 3, representatives and taxes, and originally we were going to use it for tax allocations too, we got rid of that in 1913, um, but they'll be apportioned among the states which may be included according to their respective numbers. Okay, and then we get, of course, the infamous three-fifths compromise, because the question was, who are we going to count? What is the population? How do we think about that? And the answer at the time was to struggle with the problem of that the political, uh, politically active population, in other words, which was essentially property adult white men at the time, was only a very small fraction of the total population, which included women and children and indentured service and servants and most notably slaves. So the solution was to count everyone, but to discount the slave population to three fifths, in other words, 60% when doing the apportionment allocation. And because Indians at that time were not considered to be part of the sovereign state, they were not counted at all. And it's the only group that was resident in the continental US that wasn't counted initially in the census and wasn't added really and counted well until the late 19th century. The final thing that the framers had to figure out was, okay, who should do this? Should the states do the counting or should the federal government? And they decided that it was that Congress had to take charge of this function, uh, even though the federal government was very tiny at the time. And they also basically said, we're going to do this regularly. We're not going to do it occasionally or and so forth. So they put it on the 10 year cycle. So here we are looking at the patterns that have developed from that. And the, I'm gonna show you a bunch of maps and graphs and so forth now to illustrate this. And so the, and the important thing is the US was the first nation in the world to take a census and use it. Not, only, not the first one to take it, but to use it and connect it to its political system. Because of the demographic dynamism and diversity of the population, the census therefore acts like a, um, a uh, almost like an election to shift political power every decade from areas that are growing uh, to areas that are growing from areas that are less populated. And you can see here, this is a one example of a, 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 of a two or more race um, a map that the Census Bureau puts out. Um, now you're gonna see a bunch more. Um, we, the growth has been, has, you know, which we take as normal. We've gone from 13 to 50 states to 50, 65 to 435 members of Congress. The average congressional district after the 2010 census was larger than the total population of any of the original 13 states, and that was Virginia at the time. Growth has been differential. Some states and local areas lose while others gain. So you can go up and down. This is a map of that the Census Bureau puts out to illustrate this. This is not a light map. This is a population density map that shows that, you know, those all that big black area in the Great Plains, there's not very many people out there, whereas there's lots of people on the coasts and around the Great Lakes and uh, and and uh, and that represents the power bases of this country. So I'm going to compare it here to other countries to show that we grow faster. Um, in the 18th century, when the census, when the U.S. started, of course, the U.S. population was smaller than Britain and France. Um, it got very quickly by the middle of the 19th century, overtook its former European uh, uh uh, nations and even Japan, which is a rapidly growing, was a rapidly growing country, um, has 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 plateaued, whereas the U.S. keeps growing. 
And here you see the same pattern with the admission of the states of the union on the left and the size of the House of Representatives on the right. Um, what we have, of course, is that the, um, you know, the, the 13 states have become 50. The House size has gone from 65 to, you know, to 435 um, with a flat line, which I can talk about if anybody's interested after 1910. Now, um, here's this 2010 census results. This was the last one we did. And um, this is the number of people per county. And again, you can see the, the darker the green, the more populous the area is. And here's one that shows population change. So those purple areas are areas where the population is going down. And the green areas are those where the population is going up. And so what's going to happen is that after the census is that political power through apportionment and redistricting will shift out of the purple areas and toward the green areas. So let me give you a pattern to show you how this works. Um, New York State on the left has a pretty standard population growth pattern for a couple hundred years with one, you know, with a little bit of a blip. Look at the size, look at the patterning though of its house delegation, which goes up and down and up and down. Why? How can the population grow and yet uh, a state lose seats in Congress? Well, it basically is a result of the original structuring of the census and the apportionment system, which is that if someplace grows faster than you do, um, you lose. And that's the pattern in the mid 19th century when the West grew rapidly and then New York industrialized and uh, it grew, it gained back the seats that it had lost. Then the South and the West grew and it lost again. And so this patterning, and you can draw a map like this over for every state in the country to see these patterns over time. Okay, the, um, uh, this is the changes in the house seats after 2010. Again, the blue areas are places that are gaining political representation from the census and the green and um, areas are going to lose. And you can see, unfortunately, that the, up, you know, the, the, the uh, Northeast and the Midwest are the, uh, are the slow growing regions of the country and they weren't a hundred years ago, they are now. And the South and the West are by and large are still growing. Okay, so we, I, you know, the census also was used to integrate all those territorial acquisitions that the U.S. got, the Louisiana Purchase, the Texas Annexation, the Mexican Cession, the Oregon Country, and the Gadsden Pur Purchase into the United States. The little red dots, which uh, on the next slide you'll see blown up a little bit, is the Census Bureau's effort to understand what that actually sort of means in human terms. So what they did is they developed a method that says, okay, let's take the land area of the United States make everybody the same weight, put them on a map and point and find the point on which that map balances perfectly. And what it shows, of course, is the westward um, trajectory of the population well into uh, the mid 20th century. And now the southwestward trans, uh, trajectory in it's now in Missouri that should continue in the 2020 census. You'll see another Blip. And if you go around the country, you, you'll find historical markers on these all over the country in the places where they are. Okay, we also figured out how to manipulate the results from the census for political advantage very early. So the first gerrymander uh, named after Elbridge Gerry, the Massachusetts governor, um, was 1812. And this appeared in a local newspaper that was outraged by the shenanigans that the Gerry administration had used to ge generate a district um, to the advantage of his party. Now we all know a, a great deal more about gerrymandering today, but it is a very old uh, process. and um, we, the courts have still not quite decided what we're going to do about that as a manipulation. So I now I'm going to talk a little bit about the technical continuity and change in taking the census. And on the left, you have a, uh, a painting, which is in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York of uh, a census taking in 1850. Uh, you have a Harper's Weekly uh, uh, image drawing from 1870, and then the 1930 image that I showed you earlier. You'll notice that nobody, whoops, go back, please. Um, no, you'll notice that nobody's social distancing on this. You know, this is a very intimate, close, 
process when you have um, a, a human uh, family interaction. And that's going to be important as we talk about how we handle this pan pandemic. Next, now we can move on. So let's look also at some of the questions. The questions are actually quite simple. Age, sex, race, ethnicity, location, and household composition. Most of these derive directly from the constitutional mandate. We need to know uh, about where people are in order to allocate uh, congressional and legislative seats. We need. We ask about household composition simply to understand the nature of the uh, um, the uh, the American d demographic patterns. Race ethnicity goes back to the three fifths compromise, and age and sex were added initially, actually in in, in the first census because they the first census was trying to find out how many adult white males there were of militia age. So you had to ask something about age and sex to get those. There have been lots of other questions um, and they've changed a lot. Um, we asked obviously about slave and free status until um, the Civil War and the 13th Amendment abolished slavery. Some questions are open-ended where you write down um, uh, a handwritten answer. Uh, some questions don't apply to everybody. You know, we don't ask children if they have an occupation. Uh, the instructions say, don't bother answering that if it's not, if it doesn't pertain to you. So there's a lot of variability as well. Okay, so let's talk a little bit now about technology, which is the particularly important in the current environment that we're in. Um, I've got some shots here of the of the in, in, in the um, first technological innovations with the woman sitting uh, with a key punching machine, an early key punching machine, and uh, and then uh, below it um, a much older, a much more recent picture of the of of key punchers. Um, to the left is a computer console and so forth. What you can see is uh, from a lot of these is that this is a very that even the tabulation and the the processing is very labor intensive. There's a lot of people involved doing this. Okay, uh, the computer actually automated a great deal of things. And um, this looks, um, uh, this is 1950, which is the first non-defense computer, which was commissioned for the United States Census. Uh, in 1950, and you can see how sleek and new and also large, that computer probably has the same power as what your handheld right now. Um, and the mapping is also a very important issue because again, for the apportionment and redistricting, believe it or not, the mapping was very late to be automated. And so what you see is hand-drawn maps. This is as late as 1960. Uh, it was done, oh, you know, started almost from scratch. There was no computerization of it until the 70s, um, really, until we get what is called the Tiger Math System, the Topologically Integrated Geographic Encoding and Reference System, which is a national map on which we put every little street segment in the country, and then um, a master address file, which puts every single residential address on that map. So once you do that, then you can automate um, a great deal of the collection process first through the mails and then eventually now with the um, internet and phone data collections. Move on. Okay, so now we're going to talk about 2020. Where are we now? Uh, all right. So the hot new thing for um, 2020 was the real power, the really important shift from a paper form, which is what we've been using from 1790 through 2010, really, to um, a smartphone or an internet option collection. This has gone rather better than people worried about it. People worried that it might get hacked or it people wouldn't be able to access it. It's actually done pretty well. Um, and I'll give you some more metrics of that in a minute. So how do we know how it's doing, how we're doing? We started the census, of course, as of April 1st, 2020. Um, and uh, partly because if you're gonna do this um, remotely and if people are going to be asked either through the mails or which goes back a couple decades or um, uh, on the internet, we need to have some mechanism to sort of encourage people when they get the little postcard in the mail to do it to uh, like, how are we doing? How's it going? So what they've 
and this innovation actually goes back to the 2000, but it's much more important um, as the internet access to, uh, for the total society has gotten greater. So starting in the late March, uh, we began to post uh, as a country how what proportion of census self-response are by state. And this is from a week or so ago. This is then it was 51%. And you can see the differences by uh, local area. The bluer you are, the better you are. So this is um, a couple days ago. This is the most recent one. I think it's a little higher now. Every day they update this. It's um, the goal. Their goal was to get uh, just over 60%, and they're very close to that. You can see an interesting pattern there, which is that the the, the computer sort of wipes wash washes it out, but those white areas at the bottom are in the 50% range. The Upper Midwest has always been you know, good responders. So as you'll see in the next slide, uh, where I focus in on Wisconsin, you'll see that we're much higher. So Wisconsin had by county has a response rate of 66%. Although there's a real difference between the northern part of the state and the southern part of the state, and then that that orangey uh, area in the middle. Because the Census Bureau loves um, to give you more detail on everything, um, this is the township breakdown of that map. Uh, and what you can see, by the way, Milwaukee is missing because it's not a township. So you you know you have to go to a different map to get the city. But you can see that the blue, the darker the blue, you know, we're up into the um, you know seventy five percent or above in parts of the country. In the northern part of the state, it's very low. And now I'm gonna tell you why. Okay, but first I wanna tell you, we're gonna talk about a little bit about what everybody was concerned about before the census um, started. In other words, before this pandemic, um, we worried as we always do about the cost of the census, whether there will be political differences in Congress and the president, will Americans answer? How the, will the reapportionment of redistricting change? And the big issue from 2018 to 2019 was uh, was a proposal to put a question on citizenship in on the main census form, which had never been there, and it generated lots of lawsuits challenging it. Finally, the Supreme Court in the summer of 19, 2019 basically said that the, um, the uh, not enough. Uh, uh, work had been done to make sure it was uh, would work, and therefore the Commerce Secretary had violated what was called the Administrative Procedures Act. The result was that it didn't go on the form because there was no time to correct it. And we worry about accuracy. Are we going to get everybody? And that's a big issue now that we have a pandemic. So let's move on to that. Now we're talking about what's going on now. Uh, we start the census every decade in remote Alaska. <laughs> and, and part of it is a PR campaign, but part of it is that, that these are um, populations that are migratory. And so you have to count them before they take off for their hunting and fishing uh, grounds uh, in the spring. So what you have here is a shot of the census director on a dog, on a uh, snowmobile, uh, taking the first census in January 21st. Right. By March, when the um, internet option and the big mass mailings were going to start for the 130 to 150 million addresses, everybody was going to get notified to fill out a form, um, the COVID-19 had taken over. And the Census Bureau responded initially by saying, please respond by online phone or by mail. And this is a quote from, um, from their um, public relations promotions. Now, of course, things are much more fraught than they had been. Um, and what so what you can see is a two step, you know, a two two processes going on. One is the um, the internet and phone and mail options are proceeding as planned, if you will. Uh, but by mid-April, um, the census um, bureau and the Trump administration basically said, look, we're, we're having real trouble with this. Um, we need operational adjustments. And in other words, we need to let, you need to let us take more time to do this. And because the, the deadlines for reporting the data and using it are in statute, please change Congress, please change the statute. Remember the constitutional function. This is in such manner as Congress shall by law direct. 
So they're posting new operational schedules. Now, what you what you see here is that that and that slide, if you remember that all that orange stuff in northern Wisconsin, it turns out that large parts of the country that either do not have standard address uh, lists or vacation areas never were intended to be counted in that first round of internet. Um, access where you got the postcard. So parts of some substantial part geographically, particularly of the country, literally haven't gotten a census form yet. And so the response rates are very, very low. You can go in and go, go on to the Census Bureau site and, 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 and volunteer, but people haven't gotten um, uh, the, the prods that they need. And the what is called the non-response follow-up operations, what is called NRFU, N-R-F-U, the Census Bureau loves acronyms, um, which was to start again in April and May, has been postponed uh, to June, July, August, and sometimes even into September and October. I can talk about in detail about what's happening. So the question now is, have we ever done this before? Has it happened before? What did we do about it if it happened, if it did? And so the short answer is never in the history of the census in the US has there been a kind of national uh, kind of uh, pandemic or event that has disrupted the whole country. But there have been operational glitches, failures and challenges uh, in particular areas and parts of the country repeatedly. And the Census Bureau developed all sorts of ways of managing those things. And so the question I'm gonna suggest now is, okay, what do we do about it? How are we as a society going to address these matters? Okay, so I'm gonna give you some funny examples. One is um, back to 1850. If you remember your American history, California was only admitted to the union in 1850 after the Mexican war. Uh, there was no overland transport um, at that point between the West Coast and the East Coast. So the census forms had to go around South America to, for, to get from California to Washington. They got lost at sea, a lot of them. So the census superintendent informed um, the Congress and his superiors saying, I don't have enough forms, what do I do? Congress basically said, yeah, you'll get to, we think you should, get two seats in, in Congress, even though you only have submitted enough forms for one, we'll give you two. So they found, they essentially said, and then we'll count a little later. So they, California did a state census in 1852. If you go into the publications of the 1850 census, you'll see the results of that census attached to the information on California. Similar problems emerged after the Civil War where the, the um, country was very unsettled. Um, the military, you know, the South was still militarily occupied. Uh, the numbers came in low. Uh, they were, um, uh, Congress basically looked at them and said, we're gonna apportion anyway, uh, based on what we had. I mean, interestingly, the effect of uh, the abolition of slavery increased the power of Southern states in Congress because they lost the discounted 60% um, uh, for slaves. So they went to full counts. So, uh, but 20 years later, um, the Census Bureau um, said, well, we really think that you know, there were more people. So they changed 20 years later, the official count. And if you look in government publications of the historical population, the um, official count for 1870 is 1.26 million higher than the census actually counted. Okay, fires. Um, local areas have catastrophes. Um, this one is 1980, much more recent. The entire um, um, bud styes uh, census office burned, a couple hundred thousand census forms uh, were destroyed. This is all paper, you know, the, um, if you will. And um, the, um, they recounted, right? And they did it, uh, you'll see the fire was in, the, in October. They did it in time to get the results for the December reapportionment. So it is possible to go back not I, um, and do this, and we have done this around the country. I have many other examples of this. So the problem that we have to do is that, that we're facing right now is that we have to get down to the household level to count. 
and it's labor intensive and we're going to need to take the, the um, pandemic um, and safety of both the enumerators and the respondents into account going forward, right? Right, so we're, you know, conjure that slide up with everybody wearing masks, right? And of course, Congress is going to have to sit and say, um, and the White House is going to say, do we change that section of what is of the statute, the census statute, Title 13, um, uh, and change the date? So right now, it's supposed to be done nine months after the census, which is the end of this year, December 31st. Is that the right date? Will it affect apportionment redistricting? There's, um, there's, they're proposing moving the redistricting data um, release back as well. That will affect state and local governments. Um, and then of course, the big question is, are we gonna get a good census out of this after all? So I'm gonna conclude here very briefly by saying, yeah, we have some historical par parallels of this too. Some good, some not so good. One is that we discovered that the, um, that the census contains differential undercounts. Uh, you know, there, there was a sort of general sense that there was a problem, that there were some places were counted better than others, but there wasn't much that could be done about it until the late 20th century when uh, other measurement systems, statistics, probability sampling, you know, the pu public opinion polling uh, industry got going and we could actually not only um, sort of anecdotally talk about it, but figure out how to measure it. Because of course, if you're gonna, you know, if you're gonna fix um, an undercount, you have to be able to say how big it is. Is it a little problem or a big problem? What the census did um, facing uh, lawsuits from all over the country for uh, 20 or 30 years was develop technical change in census operations. They managed um, the, the, the more elaborate technical ones, the, what was called adjustment, were not authorized um, um, by uh, either the Census Bureau or necessarily the, you know, the, the courts. But census change, taking changed and got better. Um, and over that time, and a lot of the technical innovations that have led to the internet auction, you know, you can find their roots in this controversy. The other issue, the other one, and this is where I'm going to stop, um, is um, the, and I get asked about this a, a lot, which is what about the Spanish flu and World War I? Right? Well, it turns out that the Spanish flu hit in 1918 and 1919, not in 1920. So it didn't hit during the spent, you know, the collection of the data, but it did affect um, the results of the census um, substantially. Uh, the twenty census, the nineteen twenty census was um, not, the enumeration proceeded, but there were bumps uh, from the fact that the U.S. was coming out of World War One. Immigration had been shut down during the war, and a flu epidemic had taken hold, and lots of parts of the country thought their counts were wrong because of that. The result was that Congress hit, uh, hit a political crisis and couldn't pass a uh, reapportionment law for uh, nine years. And the solution to that was to create what the system we have now, which is the automatic apportionment system, which is uh, in place now, namely that this, the results are, are reported. And unless Congress rule, you know, votes to override them, uh, the, they go automatically into effect. But, be, but because there was this crisis, the Congress and the Electoral College were not reapportioned from 1911 until 1932. And that did have political implications um, that resonated through the rest of the 20th century, which I can talk about. Thank you. Um, I think that's an awful lot to have given you in a fairly short period of time. And now I, I assume there's some questions. Okay, I, um, this is a question I often get. Does the three PIF compromise means only 60% of the slaves were counted? The answer is no. All the slaves were counted, but their total in a state 
if there was 100 slaves, say, in a state, they counted for only 60 people in the apportionment formula. So all slaves were counted. We have very good data on uh, the slave and the, uh, as well as uh, the free population of the United States. We have very poor data on American Indians because of course they were not to be included in the census. When do we start by mail? Uh, 1970. Uh, un until then, uh, the up until from 1790 to 18 1960, there were the whole process was done by people on the ground, uh, walking the neighborhoods. Uh, in 1970, about 60 percent of the population got uh, a census form in the mail. The rest, uh, as and as the technology improved for the census, the mail address filed by 8, 1980 it was up to 90 percent. After that, the enumerators only uh, chased down the people who did, you know, for the addresses that they didn't get an answer from. When did African Americans to begin to be fully accounted for in the census? And now, how are uh, non resident illegal immigrants counted? Okay, African Americans have always been fully counted in the census. Always, um, and we, um, you can go back to the, the data that's been published all the way back to 1790 and identify. Um, slaves who were assumed to be African American and uh, what was called other free people uh, or people of color who were also considered mostly African American. Um, non resident illegal immigrants, this is a really complicated question. Um, all people in the United States, except for diplomats um, and um, people uh, connected to um, tourism and you know the tourists and so forth are counted in the census. There is no identification of whether somebody is illegal. So a non-resident can be like a diplomatic person, a diplomatic uh, uh, member of an embassy and so forth. But the uh, an, an, uh, there is there's no way to identify whether a someone is a citizen or a non-citizen, legal or non-legal. And we've always counted them. Uh, when you say, is there a way on the census website to confirm they have your vote? I assume you mean your response to the census form here um, and you have been counted. Not to my knowledge. That's a very good question. Um, uh, I, I guess I could ask how you how people filled it out. Um, uh, I guess the way you would know, um, you can assume that they have received it unless someone comes to your door and says, no, nope, it went awry somewhere. Ah, uh, how do they find enumerators? Well, if, if you've been watching, again, there's there's a lot of um, promotional work done for the census before it uh, to try to recruit people to be enumerators. Essentially, you need hundreds of thousands of people around the country, and they need to be sort of locally connected and rooted. They need, you know, the Census Bureau needs to find people with the right languages who who are what they call trusted voices in the community so that you, you try to find enumerators from the neighborhoods who uh, are the best ambassadors to do the work. And that process has been ongoing. You then, you apply like you do for any other job. Um, they do background checks, uh, you get trained and hired. Um, the pay rates are been, for this census were particularly high because the, you know, when we were recruiting, um, of course the unemployment rate was very, very low. So they were offering very high, very high pay um, in order to take this temporary job. Why did they recognize um, the, the statisticians understood that there was an undercount and there were problems. I mean, the, the, the classic example for this is the 1940 census, which was taken at this, you know, on the just in, the, you know, as World War Two was you know, growing and had already broken out in Europe and the U.S. put in a draft. Um, uh, and so men of uh, 21 to 35 were required to register with the draft board. Uh, and the census was in the field at the same time. It turned out that many, many more men registered for the draft than the Bureau said 
existed in the country. And importantly, it was differential. 13%, I think the figure is more black men registered for the draft in 1940 than the census said existed in the country. I think the number was like 3% for white men. So we discovered both the undercount, uh, men, you know, young adult men are, are, hard, are hard to count because they're very footloose, but we also discovered the differential. The problem was at the time that there was no way to, um, um, to do very much about it. And, and it, it didn't matter all that much because we were also in a period um, where the, the apportionment and redistricting processes were much what I guess would call looser and sloppier than they are today. Um, in the 1960s, the Congress put in uh, what is called the one man, one vote criterion or the one person, one vote criteria for um, uh, electoral districts. There was no such tight requirement. So, you know, so you miss five or 10% of people. Eh, it doesn't matter very much. Once you did one person, one vote, it mattered. And that was in 1970. April 1st is the apportionment, is, is the census date. Um, Reapportionment probably will occur. The Census Bureau is asking for, I think, the, the, um, that date to be moved to April 2021. In other words, a couple months later. But uh, it's a f because apportionment is a fairly uh, gross process in the sense that um, the, the um, you know, with when you have congressional districts in the seven, eight hundred thousand range. Um, uh, it, it, we know pretty much right now which states are going to gain and lose. Uh, I didn't put that slide in, but there's general consensus among both political parties about where the growth, where the, sh the sh shifts are going to, where the seats are going to shift. So that process will go forward. The redistricted one is where things are much trickier because you need good, lo very tiny lo local area data to do the redistricting. What happened to all the detail questions that used to get asked? That's, um, they have been shifted to a different survey called the American Community Survey. Um, what the Census Bureau did, um, again, starting in, in the mid 20th century when they realized that the census was getting very unwieldy and burdensome and that um, statisticians and public you know, um, social researchers had figured out how to do probability sampling, what we use now all the time, that they could ask, um, a lot of the detailed questions on a sample rather than on a, you know, than a complete count. So from the, the 70, you know, from the 60s and 70s through 2000, um, we created something called the long form. So people, there were two different forms. Some people, most people got 80, per, 80 to 90 percent got a, 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 the short form, like I described. The rest, 10 to 15 percent got a long form. In after 2000, um, they moved the long form survey to something called continuous measurement and renamed it the American Community Survey. And that's in the field for a couple million households all the time, every year, and is ongoing. And um, every year we get the long form data, sample data published um, instead of just getting that data once every 10 years. Which, I mean, by the end of the decade, it used to be pretty old data. Now we get it all the time. So that's where those questions have shifted. And that's, by the way, where the citizenship question shifted uh, and um, still provides the citizenship data that we use in this country. Group quarters, oh, God. Right. Um, this is exactly why the Bureau, um, if you go to their website and say, how are you going to handle this operation, group quarters being one of them, um, what you get is a to be um, arranged. They haven't figured it out yet because until it's safe to actually do it, um, we, um, 
uh, you know, things are on hold. The, the, there's another fly in the ointment because the technical counting is supposed to be done as of April 1st, not in July or August, right? So one for group quarters, we can ask, and this is true for, by the way, college dormitories as well. We can ask who was there or should have been there on April 1st and get what are called administrative reports from the uh, management of the group quarters. And I think they're gonna use a lot of that. There's all sorts of technical questions about how accurate it'll be, but that's, you know, that will be the procedures. Again, uh, college dormitories are another very, and college students, by the way, counting college students are another very complicated group right now because people dispersed just as uh, the census hit in April. Thank you very much, Margot. That was a fascinating and timely talk. I've okay. always been curious personally where the term gerrymandering came from. So now I know. Um, okay. Please, uh, thanks to all the alumni with us today. Join us next week when we are featuring Margot's colleague, Joseph Walzer, and he'll share more about the Encyclopedia Milwaukee. It has more than 700 online entries and many aspects of culture and history are covered. It offers a really unique look at Milwaukee's colorful past. So we're all really looking forward to that as well. And thank you again for being here today and sharing your expertise with us. Thank you.